Uh, next speaker is Dr. Arnold Eisel from the University of Pennsylvania, Environmental Nutritional Factors uh, Concerning Dementia in Vulnerable Populations. Um, he is an adjunct member, Environmental Neurosciences, Center of Excellence in Environmental Toxicology at, uh, at UPenn. First, uh, I'm just going to refer to uh, the VA data since it's the largest ACO in the United States. And as you can see, there's practically a double the rate for African-American uh, individuals as well as Hispanic individuals compared to the white population and the VA population with regard to the incidence of dementia. Now, uh, I need to refer you to an article that I authored with Thomas Fulop at the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec, where we identified the, about a dozen different factors that cause the microglia activation that Julia was referring to. So this includes not only gut dysbiosis, but oral dysbiosis, metal toxicity, hepatic dysfunction, orga organic toxicants, Insulin resistance and lipid peroxidation generally go hand in hand. Biotoxins, which are a big factor, but I will not be discussing that today. Nutritional and hormonal factors. I will be discussing nutritional factors, and as well as infectious agents and immune dysfunction. I think air pollution has been already well covered. So starting with the gut, this is a study that was conducted in obese African Americans, both with and without mild cognitive impairment. And they had very distinctive microbiomes. So the, those who had no cognitive impairment uh, had identifiable increased amounts of ectromancia uh, which has also been associated with decreased microglial activation, where on the other hand, the individuals who had cognitive impairment had in this study an excess of methanobacter uh, bacteria. And there are other species, this is not the only study I would cite, but I will be moving on from this microbiome. But first showing you the correlation is very high between having a lot of acromancia and scoring well on cognitive. I like to now focus on heavy metal contamination because it is disproportionate in both the African American and Hispanic population. So uh, this shows you the particular heavy metals that were identified in a study um, eight southeastern cities, including Raleigh. That arsenic was up 13.5%, cadmium 5.5%, lead 10.5%, and that all these were of statistical significance. Now, what, what happens when you're exposed to excess toxic metals? They enter body through several different routes. One in particular I'm pointing out now is the olfactory neuroepithelium. So that is a direct route to the brain. But it can be uh, consumed through the gut. It can be inhaled, obviously, as we've already heard. And what does it do when it gets into the brain? It can affect and actually damage the blood-brain barrier, but it has a number of other factors that, that produce neurotoxicity as well. And, and this uh, is a study uh, where they looked at whether the community was well integrated or highly segregated. And what they found was significantly higher lead levels and iron levels in the air in the areas that were highly segregated as opposed to well integrated. And you can say, well, what, what about, well, iron's not so toxic. Well, actually, all the essential metals that your body cannot function without in excess become 
a toxic metal. So that applies not only to iron, it applies to copper, it applies to even selenium. Now, why should uh, somebody who's uh, less well off be more exposed to these particular pollutants? Well, here is the, or the point source contamination, starting with the proximity to traffic, proximity to uh, treatment disposal facilities, <laughs> proximity to Superfund sites, proximity to uh, commercial risk management facilities. And uh, you can see then why in these communities that Included Raleigh, why there was a higher exposure of African Americans and Hispanic individuals. Now, this is a, a, a slide taken with reference to pregnant women. So, you ask, when does the exposome start? It starts before you're born. So, in this case, it shows that both the Latino uh, individuals, women, and the African American ones, and much higher rates of cadmium. The straight line is uh, a reference point of Caucasian uh, pregnant women. So cadmium was the highest, chromium was quite high, of course, lead was elevated, and the one at the bottom is strontium. <laughs> Now, this is a study uh, which uh, I was uh, the uh, corresponding author on. And this was conducted in a cognitive neurology plan. So there, there are two sets of patients here, one with mild cognitive impairment and one with dementia. What you can see is that 70% of them have elevated homocysteine. I'm really surprised this is the first talk. At a, at a talk on dementia, first mention of homocysteine, which is the single best predictor of whether you're going to develop dementia or not. Now, uh, as you can see, there's not a single metal that's, uh, that's elevated to the, to the exclusion of all the others. They're all, to some degree, somewhat elevated. So two-thirds in both the MCI group and the dementia group were elevated. And we didn't mention all the metals. We didn't measure aluminum. So this is hardly completely comprehensive in that sense. There was probably other metal detect toxicity that we did not detect. Uh, about half of the both groups had evidence of insulin resistance. Not a surprise, but is contributory. And then the other factor is elevated ammonia. This is obviously a sign of liver impairment, but it also can be a sign of gut dysbiosis. Because remember, gut, gut dysbiosis often goes hand in hand with fatty liver disease. And then uh, there is uh, about 10% at evidence of B12. Now, arsenic and is one of the metals that have been identified as promoting insulin resistance. So it's not simply dietary related. It can be taken in, in any of the previously described methods. Now, this is a geospatial analysis for the different ethnic groups of the same country, but it looks like it's a different country. If you look at the degree of contamination, this is in regard to drinking, drinking water, whether it contains arsenic and uranium. Okay, so on the, the lower right, you have the white, and that you hardly see any right there at all. When you go to the upper left is the Latino map, and you do see some right there, but not, not nearly as much as when you get to the black map. And also, if you look at the Native American uh, map, you see, uh, obviously, up in Washington State, 
around the Hanford nuclear facility, uh, where there are eight different tribes of Native Americans. That's where they built the Hanford uh, nuclear facility that was the uh, site of the plutonium reactor uh, for doing the, uh, the uh, nuclear bomb. So hepatic dysfunction. Hepatic, the brain is very dependent on the liver for producing DHA or docosahexaenoic acid because that is the essential building block for the brain, which is over 60% lipid. If you can, you can predict with great reliability whether an elderly person is going to have cognitive impairment. If you measure the DHA over the AFLA ratio, the R value is 0.78 and the P value is 0.001. And the other side of the coin is if you take a patient who has mild cognitive therapy, uh, supplement them with DHA, you can actually show an improvement in cognitive. Now, this is a slide showing how ethnicity can affect your uh, chance of developing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or metabolic fatty liver disease. So as you can see, the risk is considerably greater in Hispanic patients. It's actually somewhat lower in African-American patients than white patients. Now, I think I... I am across the reason why it's so high in Latino patients. And this is a, a slide from uh, Leo Trisandi's group at NYU. And this is in regard to DE. DE, as you recall, is a uh, byproduct of DDT. And if you're asking why, why are we still talking about DDE, it's because the, the half-life is 150 years. And it is also, uh, it is present in wrestling. As you can see, if you look at the maximum American line in this study, that they have uh, about a six-fold increase compared to the white, to the amount of DA, uh, DDE. Uh, which is an end up in uh, disruptor chemical. That the, the multiracial in this particular study is probably other Latino groups, which is why it's so high in the multiracial, as other Latino countries have had a slower rate of uh, eliminating DDT from the environment. And this study, I think, is important because it shows it's not only the exposure to DDE. That determines whether you're going to get that. It's the combination of the exposure plus the lifestyle. So if you have an unhealthy diet, you have a sedentary lifestyle, and you have exposure to DDE, then you will wind up much more likely to wind up with fatty liver disease. And this study shows that the, the heavy metals and the uh, fat metabolism is actually synergistic in grass. So in this case, if you look on the extreme right, you have both high levels of cadmium and low levels of, in this case, omega-6 fatty acids. So they wound up with a sevenfold increase in the rest of developing cognitive impairment. And this is from NHANES. And this is a study uh, that I referred to where they actually supplement with uh, omega-3 fatty acids and showed significant improvement in perceptual speed, working memory, mental arithmetic, and spatial imagery efficiency. So several components of cognitive function were significantly improved providing DHA and EPA 
omega-3 fatty acids. Now, why is DHA so impactful on cognitive function? It is because it has so many different roles in the central nervous system. It modulates gene expression, it modulates neuroinflammation, it modulates enzyme and receptor effectiveness. Moving on to diabetes. Diabetes type 2, you are all familiar with. Diabetes type 3, uh, first described by Suzanne Delamonte at Brown, is when you just have the insulin resistance in the brain. Now, what does insulin have to do with in the brain? It's obviously not uh, part of glucose metabolism there. It might be, but it also functions as a growth factor. So that insulin has an uh, effect on both glial cell and neuronal cell function. Now, this is a slide with regard to the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. And as the uh, red is African American and the light green is Hispanic, and you can see that, particularly for the males, there's a very high consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. For the females, uh, they're still higher than, than for Caucasian or for uh, Asian. As you can see, Asian has the lowest for both male and female. But it's not just diet that determines whether you're going to get diabetes or not. It also depends on your, your exposome, your exposure to a variety of endocrine-disrupting chemicals that can promote, among other things, they can promote diabetes. Phthalates in particular, but all of these potentially might be promoting diabetes. So this study from uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago demonstrates that in particular, the phthalates were highly, if you had a high phthalate level, it, it was predicted that you would have evidence of insulin resistance. And they also found that this was occurring predominantly in uh, in the study in Chicago, Mexican-Americans and Black adolescents who uh, lived near highways, who often had water supplies that had the toxicants that I previously described, and consumed fast food. As you know, the fast food wrappers also contain several of these endocrine disruptive chemicals. Also, the occupation leads to exposure. So many Latino uh, Individuals, particularly male, are more likely to work in either farming or also horticulture. In addition, they work uh, commonly in buildings and ground maintenance, bringing exposure to other chemicals of a similar age. And then uh, there's a study particularly showing if you have long-term uh, occupation in agriculture, you have a 50% chance, increased chance of developing dementia. Now, with regard to African Americans, I uh, inserted the blue arrow to point out that severe vitamin D deficiency occurs in as many as 17% of African Americans. It's the severe vitamin D deficiency that we should pay particular attention because you'll see in a moment it can have a major impact on whether or not you can avoid dementia. <clears throat> vitamin D deficiency is quite predictive of both all-cause dementia, but even more predictive of all-cause dementia. And in this study, the Chicago Health and Aging Project. They looked at both African American, Caucasian uh, individuals with regard to both vitamin D uh, uh, consumption and also uh, with their cognitive function. What they found that in blacks, in particular, they found that 
they they could predict from the dietary vitamin D whether the cognitive decline was going to be present or not. But it's not only vitamin D, okay? It's also magnesium. So this study also in Haynes data showed that the African American population is often deficient in magnesium. The Hispanic population was not. Why is that so important? Because vitamin D does not work unless you have adequate magnesium. And why is that important for your cognitive function? Because your tight junctions do not work. Well, what, what tight junction are we here most interested in? The one concerning the blood brain barrier. But the other thing is, we were talking about microglia. Microglia remain in the activated inflammatory state unless you have active vitamin D and adequate magnesium to turn off the microglia. Some of you may have recognized the particles in the slide or the COVID-19 uh, uh, structure. So this is a, applicable to maintaining cognitive function, but it's also relevant to maintaining adequate immunity. So that you, uh, this is slide could be in a talk regarding long COVID as well. So nutritional deficiencies among African Americans include low magnesium. Now, in another study uh, done with using the UK Biobank, they showed you could actually correlate low magnesium with low hippocampal bond. Another uh, nutrient factor is selenium. Selenium is a major constituent of glutathione. And glutathione is is a fundamental component of, of all the antioxidant enzymes that are so essential to resisting toxins. So if you don't have enough selenium, you're not gonna be able to resist the toxins that you're exposed to in your exercise. Now this is also from NHANES data, and it's the consumption of nuts. And as we can see, that both African American and Latino populations have reduced consumption of nuts. And nuts are a major source of selenium, be a major source of zinc, and other essential metals that, that you only need in trace quantities, but if you don't have them, your immune function is not going to be, and your, not just your immune function, but also your resistance to the exposed uh, toxicants is not going to be. I, I, I noticed that the, the hotel provided nuts. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, now I want to turn to oral health and the oral microbiome. Because you hear a lot about the gut microbiome, you hear somewhat less about the oral microbiome, which may be at least as important with regard to the development of cognitive impairment, given the proximity of the mouth to the brain. So with regard to the minority populations, they report less uh, good oral health. They also report negative experiences seeking down here. With similar risks, they uh, experience 15% uh, less likely to visit dentists, 25% both for both groups, uh, more likely to have dental care not performed, and 
a third more likely to develop uh, tooth loss. And why is that important? I want to introduce to you uh, Porphyromonas gingivalis. This is a pathogen uh, which could be present regardless of race, but it seems to be particularly more common in African Americans, particularly if they have periodontal disease. And that's important because uh, if you have gingivitis, periodontitis, it increases your chance of developing Alzheimer's twofold. And that's because this particular organism produces a protease that has the name gingipane and it digests the blood brain barrier. And once that happens, there are other bacteria in the in the mouth, trepanema denticola, that can get into the central nervous system and cause neuronal damage, and obviously, myoglobal infection. This is just to show the how trepanema denticola also causes elevated hyperphosphorylated tau in this experimental model. And you've already covered pollution. So in summary, both the mouth microbiome and the gut microbiome are important and provide a means for preventing Alzheimer's if we address the issue. Obviously, we need to do more in terms of controlling toxic and exposure, but there also has to be an, an expanded role for education with regard to hepatic health and also with regard to diet. Thank you for your attention. Uh, considering the uh, broad spectrum of the uh, causes that you consider, uh, could you arrange them in the high level and low level? <laughs> I, I could try to do that. I don't have enough information to do that, but what I would say is uh, it really depends on the population. I mean, typically, an individual who's going to develop dementia is going to have more than one of these factors. So if you only address one of these factors, you may not prevent the dementia. So you really have to look at all these factors. But, it, you know, off, off the top, I would say, the mouth dysbiosis, the gut dysbiosis, and, and for African Americans, the vitamin D and magnesium deficiency have to be large components of that. This is actually the topic of our round table to range factors. And um, we can continue discussing this. Yes, uh, but I guess, I, you know, my, my question is about intervention, you know, your idea of intervention by population, and then Thinking of the inverse, the super agers, the people who live to 90 and they never develop dementia. Yeah. You know, there's something about their microbiome that they're, you know, you know, you know how, how would you characterize that? Well, one, of, one of the characteristics of the super agers is they often consume the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet not only gives you a healthy microbiome, it gives you those nutrients that I just mentioned. Okay. And obviously, the Mediterranean sun gives you. That's why we're going to Angus Barnes to mention. Yeah. 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 Uh, last question is on the gut microbiome. I find that to answer a lot of these questions, right? Uh, the interaction between the diet, the gut microbiome, right, and the brain, the chemicals and the flux of all of this, I think these are to be, uh, but I think, if, but, if, but if you choose one factor, and ignore the others, we're not going to have a major impact. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about intermittent. Fasting. So you're really popular. Uh, what you're saying is not, not only reducing calories, but you're right. Well, the current fasting is to improve the insulin sensitivity. Okay. But that alone is not going to solve the problem if your problem is is your mouth, if that amount is or your gut is. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay.